everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, uh, my name is Peter Hunt. I'm a, also a software engineer at Red Hat, working primarily on Cryo, but sometimes on Kubelet and Signode, and sometimes run C, Podman, container-related technologies. Appreciate everyone coming out uh, right before the party. Hope to get you, I, you all pumped up, uh, ready to go um, for this evening. And we're going to be talking about Cryo's senior year. Um, so I'm going to start off, quick introduction. Uh, what is Cryo? We get to, you know, and uh, Cryo is an implementation of the Kubernetes Container Runtime Interface, compliant with the Open Container Initiative. Well, it's a lot of jargon, uh, a lot of acronyms. Uh, what you can take away from that is it takes the spot in the stack that Docker used to occupy. Um, so it uh, pulls the OCI container images and starts the containers and pods. It's responsible for all of the operations underneath uh, the kubelet, but before the OCI container runtime. Um, some design philosophies that Cryo takes on is it's a balance of stability and features uh, with a focus of security and performance, and specifically, it's purpose-built for Kubernetes, and we'll describe some of the consequences of that later. So here's a quick architectural diagram of what Cryo is. So you see on the left here, Cryo, a kubelet talks via gRPC to Cryo. Um, cryo, you know, Kubelet asks Cryo to pull an image or create a container or um, start a pod. Um, cryo's image and runtime services then are responsible for doing that. Um, underneath the, so for the image service, uh, Cryo has a library containers image, which actually does the pulling, and then Cryo has for uh, the runtime service, it uses you know, OCI runtime generation to actually generate the container spec, and then uses an OCI runtime to actually start the container. Uh, for a pod, it uses CNI to provision the networking resources. And uh, underneath on the disk, you know, it uses container storage to allocate the, you know, the disk resources, like the copy on write file system. Um, Cry also has an entity called Conmon, which we'll be talking about a little bit later, but it's a container monitor um, that actually pays attention to the life cycle of the container. Why would anyone use Cryo, and why do we implore that you do? Um, so Cryo is, we uh, aim to make Cryo secure by default. So, you know, uh, we try to have a minimal attack surface by uh, reducing the set of operations that Cryo is responsible for. So with other generic container runtimes, it's responsible for a lot, of, a lot more operations in Cryo, which is only looking to satisfy the Kubernetes CRI and the things that the kubelet wants it to do. So Cryo doesn't need to build images or push images, for instance, because all it cares about are the things that Kubelet wants to be able to do. Cryo also prioritizes uh, security features and tries to get them consumable in a way that the Kubernetes API can you know, satisfy. We had experimental support for user namespaces for years before we just recently added it to the actual CRI, and that allowed folks to test it out and you know, work out some issues with it beforehand, um, and also um, you know, it was specified through annotation, so it was actually consumable by, uh, you know, in Kubernetes. We also ship with a smaller capability set because we don't expect, you know, we want um, the containers that are run in production, which is Cryo's main priority, to be as secure as possible. Cryo also aims to be as performant as possible, specifically for Kubernetes. Because Cryo's behavior is customized for uh, Kubernetes, common operations are optimized for. So. You know, currently with uh, the generic plague, the pod lifecycle event generator, the way that the kubelet maintains the state of what the status of the pods and containers are is by frequently relisting and asking Cryo, hey, what's my containers? What are, what are my containers? What are my pods? What are my containers? And it does that over and over again fairly frequently to maintain its state machine. While we're improving that asynchronously throughout this time, uh, Cryo has optimized for that use case because we know Kubelet is going to be doing that a lot. I'll also be talking about another optimization that Cryo, another set of optimizations that Cryo has made uh, a little bit, in a little bit. Um, ultimately, what we want for Cryo is for it to be boring. So, you know, even though we have plenty of these exciting features that, you know, optimize for Kubernetes, what we want really is that an admin chooses Cryo as their container runtime after deliberating over the options and then promptly forgets about it because it's doing the job that it needs to and really nothing more. And uh, we're excited to announce that we are in our senior year, hopefully. Um, 
we have uh, just recently applied for graduation, and uh, you know we're excited. We've been in the uh, as a CNC, uh, we Cryo was born in the uh, Kubernetes sandbox, uh, what, Kubernetes incubator in 2016, and then it was it moved up to a sandbox project, which it is now in 2019. And we're excited. You know, we have a lot of uh, production users that are using Cryo, OpenShift. You know. Uh, SUSE was for a while Lyft, um, and so we're we're happy with those relationships, and we think that Cryo is very ready for production now. It has been for a long time, but I think we've really proven it at this point. We got a security audit in the spring, and they had uh, mostly pretty good things to say, and you know the couple of bad things we've fixed already. So now it's all good things, um, and so we're excited for graduation, and hope to have that go through uh, soon. So uh, next up, we are going to talk a little bit about um, the container monitor that I mentioned earlier, Kanban. Um, and I'm going to talk about a rewrite of Kanban. Uh, first off, we're going to start out, what is Kanban? Um, Kanban is a little helper agent that manages the lifecycle of the container. Specifically, it actually starts the OCI runtime process, and it watches for the exit of the container. It manages the logs of the container, takes the logs from standard out, and writes them to disk. Um, uh, there's one instance of Kanban per container and also one per exec sync request. So if you have an exec probe, there's actually a Kanban running underneath there. We'll describe why that's important later. Um, cryo, uh, Kanban is called by Cryo uh, over the CLI, so it has this pretty large CLI uh, uh, set now, and um, it's currently written in C. So we have a couple of reasons that we want to go through uh, the process of rewriting Kanban, um, specifically some of the points that I mentioned earlier and why they're the consequences of those, like one container per Kanban, uh, one Kanban per container and per exec session means that there's a lot more process overhead than we'd ideally like. Everyone here knows now that the standard unit of container is pod. You know, it's 2022, Kubernetes is largely one. So we're really thinking about, um, uh, we're really thinking about uh, containers uh, in groups. Um, it's also Kanban is CLI based and we're really looking for a more like modern um, API mechanism than just passing through the CLI version. For instance, we have an API version flag that actually uh, um, we use to specify differing behavior for a uh, change that we made years ago, but you know, because of API compatibility over the CLI, that's a little bit more difficult than it is you know, with a more versioned you know, and smart IPC mechanism. And you know, it's, a, it's a bit of a clunky program. You know, it's a little tough to work with sometimes. It was written in C and it you know, started a long time ago, and you know, we, it's really served us well and it's very stable, but you know, we're looking forward and looking up and trying to uh, do new things. What we want out of our container monitor is really we want one Kanban per pod because you know the unit of containers in 2022 is now pods. Um, we want an IPC API based mechanism to speak with Kanban. CLI is good and it works, but it's clunky and it can be better. And we want a more modern language. Um, you know, C has served us well, but Everyone knows the common pitfalls of C and a lot of the difficulties that can arise from using it. Uh, and so we want to kind of work around, you know, work around those by having a language that uh, works a little bit better. So I am happy to introduce to you a program that actually satisfies all of these constraints and more. Uh, we have uh, Kanmon RS. Um, you know, I originally, it would have been cool if we could have named it Podmon because uh, you know, it's a pod monitor after all, but for some reason people said that that would be confusing. Um, you know, I wonder why. So instead we settled on Kanban RS, a Rust implementation of Kanban. It currently covers the scope of the existing Kanban, but with a couple of differences. Some highlights of Kanban RS is it has, we have a native Golang client API, which wraps Cap'n Proto as a protocol. Cap'n Proto is an API, uh, framework that's used by Cloudflare and a couple of other folks. It basically advertises zero serialization uh, between the uh, different, even different languages. So we can speak between Go and Rust, and it basically passes a block of memory over 
and those are each M mapped into uh, the different languages, so it's very fast um, and also has less uh, complexity than something like, you know, uh, gRPC or tgRPC or something. It uh, come on RS runs on the pod level, not uh, for each container, um, which is, you know, exactly what we want now. Um, and it also supports having the exec sessions within the container, uh, which is uh, beneficial. Um, it aims to keep a low memory usage, so Kanmon used something around two megs per container, and we're aiming, you know, something between four and six. It would be better if it was lower, obviously, and we're working on that, but we really want there to be no uh, memory penalty for using, you know, I, you, theoretically there should not be a memory penalty for using Rust, and, you know, if you had a pod with you know, two conmons for one for each container, and then maybe, you know, a couple of conmons for the execs. We aim for conmon RS to be much less memory than all of that would ultimately end up using. Conmon RS to be able to support pod level, um, as, you know, to support all the containers in the pod, it's going to be multi threaded, where conmon used to be single threaded or still single threaded. Um, and we have some exciting features that we're uh, able to enhance conmon RS with because. Uh, is written in Rust, so it's a little bit easier for us to add new features to it. Um, to be able to use Common RS in Cryo, all you have to do is add a, a drop-in file to Cryo's config uh, directory and specify the runtime type as pod and then point it to Common R the location of Common RS and then restart Cryo and Cryo will come up and use Common RS and hopefully you can also promptly forget about that choice. Right now we have uh, passing CRI tests and in integration tests, Kubernetes and, and Node tests, basically all of the tests that Cryo expects for, you know, a fully functioning, um, you, you know, to be fully compliant with Kubernetes. Um, Kanban RS is passing now. Um, we're planning for integration into Podman. Uh, there's a couple more uh, pieces that we need for Podman, which we've not quite gotten to yet, so we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, we have RPM packages available. Uh, and we also have static binaries uh, available for each commit. So if you want to download and use it, you can currently. And we're looking for adding more distributions in the future to be stabilized. In the future, I'd like to describe to you a world in which uh, we have all of the pieces that Kanban used to have. So there's currently some gaps. You know, we have all the functioning pieces we need for Cryo, but you know, Podman needs a little bit more. It needs an attached exec session because Podman, the process goes away. There needs to be something holding open that exec. Currently, Cryo is doing that. Um, we need checkpointing uh, for Podman and also actually soon for Cryo because we're adding checkpoint and restore um, functionality. We need uh, support for seccomp notify uh, to be able to be notified when a container uses a syscall that it wasn't supposed to or wasn't expected to. And um, the journal D log driver, which you know just adds compatibility to what uh, Podman currently uses. Uh, we also, looking forward, have some features that we're pretty excited about. Uh, PID namespace holding is one that I personally am really excited about. So currently, if you have a pod level PID namespace, you need the infra container to hold open that namespace because you need to have a PID one in the namespace to stay alive for the duration of all of the processes within the PID namespace. Currently, the infra container, I mean, it works. It's worked for a long time, but it adds a little bit of process complexity and overhead. And it would be nice if we just had some process. Imagine what a process that survived for the duration of the pod and was able to hold the uh, PID namespace for it. And Kanman RS satisfies those requirements. So I think it would be cool to be able to have the PID namespace held by Kanman RS, and then we'd be able to drop the infra container uh, in all cases. We're also looking for IPv6 uh, port forward support, which is required by or desired by Podman. There needs to be a running process to keep uh, port forward requests going in IPv6. Uh, we want a logging rate limiting, um, so and just additional log drivers in general. We have, uh, you know, right now there's like the Kubernetes log uh, format, and we're looking towards journal D, but also we have the opportunity for a JSON logging driver, which Podman has wanted for years, ever, and has never actually gotten. And so being written in a more modern language, it'll be easier to integrate some of these new features. And open telemetry tracing, which I'm actually excited to say we have experimental support for. We're still kind of working through the details of it, 
Um, and I didn't have time to put together a demo of it, and I, I wanted to. Um, but, uh, but open telemetry tracing is coming, and so you can actually track the, especially with the Kubelet's support for open telemetry tracing. And cryos, you can track the life cycle of a container from you know, being created in the API server, being registered in etcd, being created by the Kubelet, being created by cryo, and then all the way down to Kanban RS now, which uh, we think is exciting and opens up some opportunities for being able to uh, track the life cycle of your uh, containers and pods. So that's uh, Kanban RS. We're pretty excited for it. Um, and now I'm going now for something completely different. We're going to talk a little bit about some load optimizations and specifically some better reporting mechanisms that Cryo has added um, semi-recently. So if you've attended some of these talks before, you might have seen me talking about um, situations of load in Kubernetes and specifically between Cryo and Kubelet, but I'll give a refresher for anyone who's new here. So um, the problem is in situations of load, um, Cryo and Kubelet get into this bickering match where they have trouble syncing up between. So basically the Kubelet needs to have a timeout on each uh, container and pod creation request because it needs to know that when it sends out that request, that request didn't just disappear into the void. The problem about that is that Cryo, you know, can take an undetermined amount of time to create a pod or container, especially under load. Usually there's some entity that is the bottleneck. It's often the SDN or maybe the, um, maybe the disk IO. Um, and so it, Cryo might not be able to create that container in time. And because of that, Cryo and uh, the Cuba bicker about trying to create that spe specified resource. Cuba's like, hey, please create this resource. And Cryo's like, hey, I'm working on it. Name is reserved. Gets this awkward situation. So this has been largely solved um, in Cryo as of, you know, 119 or something like that. And I'll, I'll describe, so it's quite old now, um, but I'll describe the solution because we've added a little bit to that solution. So uh, the solution to it is to fine tune our behavior to the Kubelet, which Cryo is able to do because it's, you know, only for the only client that Cryo materially cares about is the Kubelet um, and running, you know, containers in production. So um, the Kubelet, the, the basic idea is to finish creating the resource and then save it until the Kubelet asks again. So, um, I'll walk us through that example. So Kubelet asks Cryo, hey, can you create me this pod? And Cryo's like, sure, I'll reserve this name so that no one else, no Crycuddle or someone can come in and try to take that pod from you. At some point in that process, maybe Cryo gets stuck on SDN because it's taking a real long time. There's a lot of pods being created at the same time, something. Cryo takes too long and the Kubelet times out. Kubelet's not sure whether the you know, timeout is because the request disappeared or because you know, it um, actually is just taking too long. So just in case, Kubelet re-requests. Hey, can you create me this pod? The second routine is aware that the first routine is working on creating that pod because it can tell that the name is already reserved. So what it does is it waits and um, basically tells the first routine, hey, when you're done creating that, let me know because I'm trying to give it to the kubelet. Um, eventually, the bottleneck either clears up or, you know, the networking, uh, you, pot, you finally, you know, ungums and Crow is able to create the uh, resource. So Crow, the, the first routine, detects that there was a timeout and, um, you know, pings the second routine saying, hey, I'm done my thing now, and returns to the kubelet. You know, cube is not paying attention anymore. It assumed that the request disappeared. So this dotted line represents cube is not really listening anymore. But what it is listening to is the second routine, which has said, you know, hey, I have this resource for you, but you need to request again. The reason we do another round of requests, even though the resource is already made, is because, you know, the um, resource uh, there might be a race between the kubelet timing out when cryo sends it, so we worry about you know having this resource disappear. So instead, we we time out one more time in the kubelet, and then um, await the inevitable kubelet re-request that uh, resource from another cryo routine. That routine sees that it has the resource and it's able to return it no problem. Uh, so this this was. Um, a uh, good optimization because it changed the situation where there used to be a lot of thrashing on the node where container would be created, it would take some time, and then it would have to be 
you know, the, the creation would time out. And at the time, we actually removed the container because it aired out. And that was bad because that actually made the, the, um, the uh, resources be even more constrained. So now, you know, we've improved the situation a lot. Now we're basically returning the resource just about as, as soon as it's actually done. Um, another, uh, you know, small piece of it is we're actually throttling the request from the kubelet. So if the kubelet had its way, or the way that it used to work is, you know, if cryo was just like immediately after getting the duplicated request, hey, I'm already working on it, I'm gonna return an error to you, kubelet, then the kubelet and cryo, like kubelet would propagate through the event API, like a whole bunch of like name is reserved, name is reserved, because cryo would be returning these errors really quickly, and kubelet's trying to create this pod as fast as it can. What, because we know that the kubelet is going to re-request this object, you know, as long as the um, error keeps being time out, what Crow can do is it can actually throttle the kubelet and wait on in this routine to saying, hold on kubelet, slow down, we're working on it, don't worry, um, taking as long as it can, so that reduces the number of events in the, the pod API. So um, that's very nice. Um, and reduces churn and makes the uh, admins not as scared because there's not a bajillion messages saying, pod is, name is reserved. A new thing that we've done semi-recently, which I'm also very excited about, is um, we return where the Potter container creation is stuck. So we used to just say this kind of generic error, like name is reserved, we're working on a kubelet, chill out. But now we're also keeping track of where in the container and pod creation process that resource is stuck, and that way we're able to return. So when resource, uh, when you know one of the one of the crowd routines that isn't the original one returns an error saying, hey, you know, we're working on it, but it's not done yet. It also says, and it's actually stuck at, you know, something like currently at stage sandbox network created. So it's saying like, you know, sometime after the sandbox network was created, we're stuck. Or it says something like, you know, sandbox storage creation. So what that error would indicate to me is that there's an IOPS throttling problem. If it said, stuck on sandbox network creation, I would guess that there's a slowdown in the bottleneck in the uh, SDN. So basically this improvement allows an admin to see, uh, you know, the state of the container or pod creation process, like why it's taking so long and hopefully make remediation steps faster. And I'm very excited for it because in the past, it took kind of just a lot of intimate knowledge with cryo and the way and the timing of things to be able to actually tell which was the problem, which I ended up doing a lot of that work, you know, for the people that I support. Um, so I'm excited that it'll be doing that for me. And uh, next up we have Renal talking about some six store stuff. All right, uh, so folks, uh, everyone must have heard about six store. Uh, well, I'm happy to say that cryo has support for six stores size signatures. So the containers image library that Cryo uses for pulling images, merge support for verifying those signatures, Podman fully supports it. Uh, so Podman can be used to sign and push those images and the signatures to a registry, and then you can use Cryo to verify those uh, signatures when you pull the images. However, we need to improve the UI of what happens when a signature verification fails. So today, the CRI doesn't uh, distinguish between the types of image pull errors. So we'll do some upstream work. So like Kubelet can distinguish and give the right message to the user when signature verification fails, instead of just a generic image pull uh, fallback. Then uh, we also did work so that the cryo release binaries are now signed using cosine, so you can verify them as well. So next I'll cover some uh, upcoming features that intersect cryo and the work we're doing in Signode. So first of them is username spaces. So, so far, like, the, like uh, this username space is supported in the Linux kernel, but Kubernetes has not been able to take advantage of it. So Peter mentioned that we had annotations-based support in Cryo. But finally, in 125, we got phase one alpha for username spaces merged into Kubernetes. So this phase one supports uh, stateless pods. It means any pods that don't use persistent volumes will work with user namespaces. So the supported volume types are, are like empty dirt, secrets, config maps, and so on. So with user namespaces, you get an additional 
a layer of security in your pods. So you can be root inside your pod while being non-root on the host. What it means is if, if a process is able to break outside of the container, it's not able to attack the host or other containers running on the node. So it's very useful. And one more advantage is we are now able to like run any random image for, from uh, any registry that runs as root by default and not have, have to worry about changing it to uh, be non-root. The kernel takes care of it for us. So here's a simple example of how you utilize this. So you just add that host user is equal to false in your pod spec, and that will enable uh, kubelet and cryo to enable user namespaces, and you are in this uh, user namespace pod. So next up in this area, we'll start adding support for uh, other types of volumes, persistent volumes, and that's something we need to uh, tackle upstream first and then make available in cryo. So checkpoint restore. So this is another feature that was uh, merged into the kubelet. So basically it uses the CRIU to checkpoint container state. It's only a kubelet API at the moment. So there's no Kubernetes API for it. So if you want to use this feature, you have to hop on a node and directly hit the, cube, the kubelet's endpoint uh, to checkpoint a container. So the current use case that is being targeted is forensic analysis. Say you're a bank and there is a, a bad actor that has, uh, in, that's able to like break out of a pod and is trying to attack or do something bad on your node. So what you can do is you can get on that node and then checkpoint the state of that pod. And then you can move that checkpointed state to another node and then you can start that pod back up again so you can analyze what, what was happening ins inside that pod. And this can happen without the knowledge of the attacker. Like they can continue being in that pod. So this allows, like, uh, this is like a security feature. Uh, so other use cases of checkpoint restore are like faster startup for pods such as JVM. So we know that Java takes time uh, to start up, right? So potentially we can checkpoint a pod after that startup phase is done and then you can launch hundreds of copies of such pods, right? So that'll, that'll be a net improvement in startup uh, time. So this is also early and like we just merged the checkpoint support. So next we'll start tackling uh, the restore support in the Kubernetes API. And finally, uh, evented plague. So today the kubelet uses the generic plague. What is plague? So it's a pod lifecycle event generator. So that's what is being used by the kubelet to materialize the life cycle of a pod. So once the kubelet starts a pod, it needs to be aware when it dies or it gets killed for some reason. Because you know, whenever it dies, kubelet starts it uh, back for you, right? And how does it know that? It knows it through the plug. The way the generic plug works is the kubelet periodically relists all the pods and containers uh, from the runtime over CRI. Now the overhead of doing this is very high when there are lots of pods. Like imagine you're trying to push the boundaries of how many pods you can run on a node. You are at 600, 700 nodes, and very frequently, the kubelet is requesting this list of pods uh, from the runtime. So this adds a lot of overhead to both the kubelet and the container runtime. So we are working on a feature called as evented plague that moves to a list watch model, like your Kubernetes operators work today. So with that, the kubelet will be able to list the pods less frequently, way less than it does now, and then rely on events being sent from the container runtime to generate the plague events. So this will drastically reduce the overhead of uh, kubelet and runtime, and hopefully we'll be able to run way more pods than we do today. So this work is targeted for 126. Um, there are PRs open, and we are hopeful that it will get merged. So this brings us to the uh, end of the talk. Uh, thanks for joining us, and we are uh, happy to take questions.
you also, so in, in a tragic event where a Kanman uh, dies before the container does, then also we don't catch the container's exit because Kanman is the parent of the container process. So it's the one that can catch the SIG child that the kernel sends when the process ends. Cryo is not, you know, at all, a common actually daemonizes. So Kanman is a child of system D, not even of Cryo, so Cryo can't catch those. So, um, you know, at one point we had a Kanman monitor, but um, Kanman mon, we called it, um, but it was uh, racy and kind of difficult to work with. So we've, uh, you know, made it, we worked hard to make sure that Kanman isn't gonna seg fault or anything like that or exit before the container does. And it actually can't be um killed either because that would be in a bad state. We're, we hope to, uh, we're, we're looking at um, situations, PID FDs would help with that where we can actually, you know, Cryo can keep track of the life cycle of the Kanman or Kanman RS instance. We could also maybe use EPPF to catch, uh, you know, Kanman exits, but we don't currently have anything. So the ideal is that that doesn't happen. Right. Yeah. As of it now, it does not. Uh, it would. You, I agree that that would be even more problematic of a situation. Um, and so we're, you know, it is on our radar trying to figure out the way to actually pay attention. You know, I really look forward to pit FDs in general. Kanban could also use them, but. Um, you know, before that, maybe we'll come up with some EVPF thing so that, like, that risky situation doesn't come up. Uh, because I wanted to have a good resume. Uh, no, because um, the well, because it like was a natural fit for kind of the the piece of the stack it was. You know, we already had Kanban and C, but it would have been kind of clunky to add, you know, um, asynchrony and you know all of these things and. Go would be, the Go runtime uses too much memory for the number of Kanmans that we want. Um, so we felt like Rust was a good fit for that. And, you know, I kind of feel like in general, the, la the, the layer of the stack that we're at, I think we're gonna start seeing more projects being written in Rust because it's a pretty natural fit for like the space. I think like, Rust has a right mix of low level and high level. So we can do all the low level things we were able to do with C while also having access to like an RPC API, like Captain Proto, that we can easily integrate while not paying a huge memory or CPU penalty. That, that was the motivation to do that. Has that attracted any contributors? Um, we have attracted some uh, interest in it, um, but not a ton of contributors, mostly people. Uh, some people are looking at, uh, you know, some issues and stuff, but it's, you know, a little slow going, but. We're hoping that also the integration of Rust into you know this whole ecosystem will um, appeal to people. So, uh, what was the motivation for using a CNI for setting up Cryo, and what are your thoughts on this CNI conflicting with other netcon uh, for say any other CNI that works? And I've seen this issue that uh, the Cryo CNI conflicts uh, a bit. So are you talking about cryo shipping a default CNI? Yeah. Or? Mm -hmm. So I think that's just something that we ship so it's easy for you to get started with cryo, right? So you can easily start up a local cluster and you'll be able to see your pods. But that's something we never recommend for production use cases. And we make it easy for you to like drop in any CNI conf and the binary and it should just work. Mm -hmm. So that's more like a starter thing to get well, yeah. and, and also actually now the packages that we ship in all of the upstream distros, they don't actually require the container networking plugins, they only recommend them. So if you know if you're on Fedora, you're able to actually install Cryo without installing the container networking plugins. Um, so it's it's not required, but you know, we, we suggest it if you don't have another solution that can come out of the box. Okay. And uh, I've seen that the plug issues I see with Kubernetes, they're not very descriptive. So uh, how would you go about uh, digging in deep in those issues and actually figuring out what's causing the plague uh, error? So I think like th there are two things, right? Like one thing P Peter mentioned is improving what we log in the container runtime. Mm -hmm. And the second part of it, like improving what we log on the kubelet side of things. Like the whole kubelet uh, code that manages sync pod and generates all this is 
is hard. And what we are hoping is with event it's like we have some ideas on how to simplify it and like make it better. And also folks on the community, folks on Google are also working on some documentation so more people can come up to speed, contribute, and simplify that whole area. The, okay. um, the, the, the existence of um, tracing support in the Kubelet, we also had the idea, um, we were talking about it today, like, of like instrumenting sync pod and, you know, or the, um, the pod workers uh, that are actually doing the plague, um, you know, generating and managing. If we were instrumenting them uh, with open telemetry, like maybe that could also give some better insight into what's going on there. Um, you'd be able to watch a span and see um, its behavior, so mm -hmm. that might help too. So right now, Conmo is so Cryo currently doesn't have open telemetry support. Um, it so it does have some preliminary support. It like I think we're still working through trying to get like figure out exactly the granularity of spans. Um, we have it on. You know, we have a number of functions that are like emitting them. I think that's, but it's in like the main branch. It's like not yet been released. I mean, Kanban still has only, it's only on like 0, 0.3.0 or something like that. So it's pretty young, but um, there could have been a demo that we did today, but I didn't have time to put it together where like you actually can see the spans. Actually, you might be able to find an image I have if I have enough time or send it to you or something of like what that looks like for Kanban RS. So we're getting there, but we're not quite there yet. Thank you. With the introduction of uh, Kanmon RS, is there plans to eventually deprecate Kanmon itself and then replace it? Yeah, yeah, I would say long term, you know, uh, assuming that we can, you know, make sure that, and I'm pretty sure that we can, this can be the case, but, you know, I just want to maintain that one of the main ideas is to make sure that the ultimate memory usage is not egregiously more than it was with Kanmon. Assuming that, which I think will be the case, then uh, eventually we'll deprecate and remove Kanmon, and it'll be Kanmon RS moving forward. And then obviously this will move upstream into like uh, OpenShift, right? Or downstream? Yeah, yeah, we're, yeah, we're working on pulling it down as well. I wanted to say very impressive work with uh, Kanmon RS, and I appreciate the description of why Rust might be the good tool for the job. Um, could you show the slide again on how to switch the CRIO runtime, and then um, maybe elaborate on like what future scenarios people might consider switching to Kanmon RS to be an early adopter? Yeah, so th this, um, this slide is the one you were looking for? Yeah, um, so there you go. Um, why, so um, why you would want to early adopt it. So, so one of the things that we kind of triggered our desire to do this is we wanted better uh, C group accounting of the Kanmon resources. So like, you know, in situations where you want to keep the Kanmon on a separate CPU set, then, you know, the container is running. If you have a real time pod that's doing some network latency stuff, um, you could, you know, that was originally what kind of got us started thinking about having a pod level Kanmon um, to be able to isolate that. So that's one use case. Um, I mean, you know, we'd be happy if folks wanted to try it out and let us know, you know, even if you just want to be at the bleeding edge because, you know, that'll help us iterate on um, getting it better and stuff. I would say, uh, oh, there was another thing that I thought. Why else? Yeah, I mean, so uh, one more thing that we wanted to tackle is like right now when we do an exec, right, we are spawning a new conmon. And at steady state on a node, your execs are the most expensive operation that a container runtime is doing. So we want to reduce that process hop here. So with conmon RS, like there won't be an additional conmon. We'll talk over RPC to conmon and it'll directly do a run C or a C run exec, drastically reducing your CPU usage. The, the other other thing that I just remembered is actually can help with uh, CPU and memory accounting on the node. So because we have multiple Kanmons now, it's hard for us to use the pod overhead feature, which was originally made for Kata, because you have like a VM that has some sort of standard amount of memory and CPU. But you know, if we have a variable number of Kanmons, we can't really well guess how much memory and CPU they'll all use, because it's not proportional to the number of containers. With pod, a Kanmon RS, it's one per pod. We can guess like, okay, it's not gonna use more than eight megs, definitely. So, you know, that's the pod overhead. And uh, 
then you can more fight, tightly fit your containers on the node because you know they're not there's not this like mysterious amount of memory that's used by Kanban. Questions? Over time. Well, let's get out of here. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining us.